Welcome to another G4 Guitar Business Show. My name is David Hart. Today I have a, a very special guest, Paul Myatt. Now, Paul has an extraordinary resume. Paul and I are of the same vintage. Paul's been in this business really since he was, uh, you know, I guess early 20s or maybe even teenager. I'll get I'll get more information on that, Paul. But, I, I, but what I do know about Paul, uh, I'm just going to go through some of the points that I have here. I can't go through everything because there's just way too much to talk about here. Um, but as a quick intro to Paul, Paul is the co-director of Forte School of Music. Uh, anyone in Australia would know of Forte School of Music. They have a, a great reputation of being one of Australia's premier music schools. And Paul founded that along with his partner, I believe, Gillian Erskine, uh, back in, when was that, Paul, back in the 80s? 1994. 1994, okay. 1994, so so they've been around a long time. Uh, it, Paul's also uh, published many books under the name of Forte and also under the Easy Learn uh, system, and he's, he's published those through uh, Warner Brothers Publishing and Alfred Publishing. Over the years, he's presented at many conferences, including this year where he was at the NAM show. Um, so if anyone here was at the NAM show, I know a few of my viewers have definitely were at the NAM show this year. Uh, and he will be back there in July, so you might want to catch Paul again then. Uh, he's also presented at uh, Australian Society of Music Educators, AMAC, which is Australian Music Association Conference, um, and ANCOS, which is Australian National Council. Um, and so, so he's actually, he's, very well known in the industry, very uh, respected in the industry. And what I'm really hoping today to, to talk to Paul about is some of the things that he's been involved with. Um, Paul's also, uh, you know, he's still teaching to this day because he's very passionate. He's been teaching, like I said, since the 80s. And he, he's teaching all ages from young children right through to, to adults. And Paul's instruments, I believe, French horn and piano and singing, are they your instruments, Paul, would you say? I'd say that. I only teach piano, but yes. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So you're a piano teacher, but you, you actually yeah, play and, and sing as well. So um, Paul is also, as I uh, discovered recently, um, is right into the technology. He's always stayed with the technology, and I had the privilege of actually looking at some of Paul's software because we're both FileMaker users, um, and what he's done there is just uh, amazing. Uh, he, he's basically brought his franchise schools together, which um, how many schools are there all together, Paul, with the Forte chain? We have uh, 16 with about 4,000 students. Wow. And, and it, it's not just in Australia, correct? It's also in That's the UK? Right. Yep. In the UK and New Zealand. And you said, okay, great. So, and so Paul's developed this software where he, he can actually manage all the schools across his software platform. Uh, yeah, just amazing. I, I know what it takes to work with FileMaker. I've been working with it, you know, for quite a few years. Um, and But Paul's been in it longer than me. And so, so uh, it really, when I look at what he's done, I think, wow, uh, it just sort of blew my mind. So let's jump into it, Paul and talk about, I just want to start with your, your history so people can get a bit of an idea who you are, where you've come from. When did you first start learning music? Oh, good question, David. The, when I was a kid, really, we had no music in my family. Um, nobody was musical. And I remember playing the kitchen table every morning um, along with the radio and begging my parents to buy me a piano. <laughs> And I got a little keyboard when I was about, must have been about five, which I proceeded to teach myself from the little books. It was all colour coded and had little keys you had um, for chords on the side. And it was obviously a harmonium because it, ra it ran with air. So it was the sound was ma manufactured from the use of uh, bellows inside the instrument. And then uh, being the 70s, it was the height of the electronic organ. And so... Right. My first upgrade, my father was a bank manager um, and back in those days to be successful as a bank manager, um, you had to travel around to get to climb the ladder. So we, I had four different primary schools in the first four years of school and um, one of the girls that was working at my dad's bank, um, he was a Commonwealth bank manager and um, back in those days, Yamaha was the biggest thing in sliced bread for the organs and um, she had... And every year, everyone would update their organ. So, you know, you'd, you'd try and sell that old organ so that you could have the money to buy the new organ because they yeah, weren't right. cheap. Yeah. Yep. But, um, but great instruments to learn. And some of Australia's best um, keyboard and piano musicians actually learnt a lifetime when they were a kid. 
And so we were out in the country. Um, the, the organ that we got, the secondhand organ, came with a big box of music. It had 200 sheets of music in it and about eight cassette tapes. And there was a little cassette player with a speed adjuster because, you know, with cassettes, they stretch. Yes, so yes. they were very clever. They put a little speed adjuster on the cassette player because, you know, there's nothing worse than playing along with a, with a track that was out of tune to your organ. So you could speed it up or slow it down if you needed to. Wow. That was cutting-edge cutting, cutting edge technology for the time. Cutting-edge edge technology, exactly. And so that's how I learned to play, um, basically uh, wanting to play these songs um, from all sorts of things. I remember... Um, I don't know if you remember, we're about the same vintage, but 1984, a song came out called Space Invaders. Yes, um, yes, after the game. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I can probably sing it for you, but I won't. Hey, <laughs> Space, yeah, exactly. So I can remember being that excited that I actually learnt to play Space Invaders and it made it sound like almost like the, the real thing because on an organ you could choose all these different sounds and things. Yeah, right. Um, and then I, uh, when I... I was in year four, I started French horn. And um, so I was a French horn player through all of high school. I continued to learn organ, I learned pipe organ. And I think one of the best things I ever did was um, play the, I used to play the organ at church every Sunday morning. Um, and great experience as a musician to play in a church. You know, you get the music on Thursday, you'd be practicing your little heart out so that you, could, you weren't making a fool of yourself on Sunday morning. And yeah. then, um, um, and then also playing um, in the concert bands, and and then I was in uh, the Queensland Youth Orchestra until they kicked me out because I got too old. Hated that. But you weren't a youth, you weren't a youth anymore. You I wasn't say. youth anymore. <laughs> Damn it. So those experiences give you really amazing ensemble experience, and so I've taken that through, and which is why I suppose today. I only teach children piano in groups where they can actually hear each other at the same time. So they learn to play together. And there's a, I think there's an innate um, benefit for them musically because they learn to play with others um, and they, they can hear, they, they play in time, but also they learn to respect other people and what they can do. So it's going to have lots of other benefits in other areas of their lives. Um, and, you know, for, for pianists especially, um, you know, the ability to play with others is so important because very few people just play the piano. Mm, it, it, it's it's funny because when we were talking the other day, uh, you you made that point that you know ear before eye, and and it was you know I think it's such a a great point. Yesterday, and this was only happened yesterday, is that my daughter who's eight years old, she was she's singing in the school choir, and they had this sort of regional choir competition mm. and so mm. she had to go there and we went and watched and you know for about two hours we watched all these different schools singing and, and some of them were amazing um how, mm. how good they were their voices and, and dynamics and and so forth at such a young age and mm. and then the at the end of it the the guy who was the head of the i can't even remember what he said um head of the australian education choral whatever um mm. who was there to judge it he, he said exactly the same thing he said that it's really important uh that you focus on your listening first that's always the first thing mm. and, and he made the point that you know singing in a choir you got to think about not just yourself but think about everyone else around you are you in sync are you in harmony is it all working so yeah so i totally agree with what you're saying with the group mm. work, yeah. Well, you know, you go into any business conference uh, or sales marketing strategy conference and they'll say you've got two ears, uh, two ears and one mouth and you've got to listen in and speak in that proportion. So in any sales strategy, you know, so it's I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's. I, I remember as a teenager the difference because I started late. You, you know, I, I, was, I, I picked up the drums at about 13, 14 and then went on to guitar a little bit later. And, and I, I look around me at these other kids who, who I just thought were freaks of nature. So they, they can just hear the music and play it. What, what, what is it with these guys? And I didn't get it then. And I just thought that some people had a gift and some people didn't. And that, that's one of the things that really drove me into teaching was that very fact. And... and and understanding that they'd had their ear 
trained at an early age, especially, mm -hmm. I, I think yeah, it makes a big difference. Like language, I guess, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, children who learn language before the age of six, so who may well be bilingual, because your wife is Japanese, so correct. Yes, does your that's daughter right. speak Japanese as well? Absolutely, yeah. She's, She's fluent probably, in both. Yeah. She pro and she probably has no accent in Japanese and no accent, well, Australian accent <laughs> in English. Yeah. Um, but you know, you, often people can't tell because they've learned from such a young age. Um, my godson, who is um, my, my business partner, Gillian's son, he, he was our test case dummy uh, from the age of six months old um, on, on, in, in our, all of our music courses. And um, he speaks, apparently, not that I would be able to tell, but he, apparently he speaks perfect Chinese without any accent. In fact, both him and his brother do. Um, and, you know, he's, uh, he plays in um, Queensland Youth Orchestra now. He's doing his, his uh, Amos in trumpet. If he, if he could, you know, he's 17. If, if his mother could <laughs> make him work a little bit harder, she'd do that on piano as well. But, you know, just incredible talent. But he, you know, and he doesn't want to have a career in music, which is fantastic. He wants to be go into economics or commerce, so or law. So he's, um, you know, it's he's has this fantastic experience of music, um, which has opened up so many things for him um, in terms of learning and experience, and you know, his social network uh, for uh, for music. But also, he's got it to you know to chill out with. So mm. he just picked up guitar and I'm amazed. He's, he's basically playing guitar. He just learns off the internet and stuff. It's just amazing because he's got all the musical skills. So all he's doing is just transferring it from instrument to instrument. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's like you say, it, it, even it's not about a career. Career is something you can do or, or not do. It's, it's, that's a choice. But having that ability, that musical uh, kind of, you know, it, to me, it's like a language again. If I can, if I can go to Japan, and for me, Japanese is a struggle. I can speak a little bit, but it's a, it's a real struggle. But if I could just go there and speak it, that'd be great. And so I think if you have, if kids have that music education, and then they, you know, 21, 22, 30, 40, whatever, they say, hey, I, I want to play uh, piano or guitar. If it's already in there, they're going to pick it up really quickly, even if they haven't done it for 10 years, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, an, an interesting point point that I was going to say, that, and I'm sure you're probably aware of this too, but they, there was a study that they did where they showed uh, putting children in front of a TV to learn to speak Chinese, uh, and they found that it didn't work. So even though they were getting the same information, the same lessons every day uh, in, on a screen in Chinese, the kids weren't really picking up the Chinese, but when they had a teacher there, like in front of them doing it, they picked it up and they learnt it. So I think it's something that, that that's for, for us as teachers. Uh, is really important to understand, and I know that you're quite passionate about this. Is that you know TVs, computers, whatever they they, they still they're not even close to replacing uh, a real person. Yeah. There's something about that interaction, especially with children. Absolutely, the devices are fantastic when they're used as a tool, not as a replacement for a teacher. So I think that's one of the things that we do at Forte, um, which we're, uh, our courses are quite unique because of the way that we teach. So we use what's called an offshore work or cross between an offshore work approach, off as in Karl Orff who wrote Carmina Burana, most people, or well, they'll know um, the beer ad. This ad is big, this ad is really big. <laughs> that's that's Karl Orff. Um, right, right. Um, so he was around in the 1920s and 30s and, and was very engaged in learning, mu in teaching music, but use, and his approach was using movement and percussion instruments and whole body percussion instruments. So we use a lot of that with our students so they get the music inside their body. Um, so it, that's, that's a really great way of getting to the end goal as well. So you get a much more musical experience. Um, so it's, a, it's just one of the things in our toolbox that go with all the technology. So we have you know, movement and we have, so in part of the technology, our courses have all have got online content. So our students can go online and they can uh, practice along with someone playing the piano. So neurologically, um, now, I have to, they're called mirror neurons. So what mirror happens neurons, is yes. mirror 
neurons. So in your brain, you actually look at something and then you can see yourself doing it. So we have videos of, of piano players playing the song that they're playing. So students can mirror that same thing in their brain. So that's, um, in fact, I've just, I've, one of the things I'm very passionate about is professional development. And this year I did a course on neuropedagogy at uh, UTS in Sydney. Um, so hence I, I've got all my, um, all the words now. <laughs> I'm dangerous. <laughs> I think we're going to be we're going to need three hours here today <laughs> through all this stuff. This is just, you know, just you know, using that technology is a great way, but it's not a replacement for a teacher. Is what I suppose. What I'm, I'm, you know, use all the technology, have all the things that you, you know, line them up. So different technologies. They might be from the 1900s, like you know, using movement, um, clapping and all that sort of stuff and then having video content and things like that. So all of that stuff is really important, but it doesn't replace a real live teacher. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think it's easy to get into this sort of uh, uh, idea that the, the AI and, and, and the internet and, and, and whatever is all just going to replace everything overnight. Um, I think that things are going to take a lot, a, a lot longer than we expect uh, for these technologies to to even become, um, you, you know, even a major player. I think still you can, you, you know, the teacher is such has such an important role, not just in the in the terms of uh, the the education, but the the feedback loop, that immediate feedback loop, the uh, the motivation, the the you know the tracking, the understanding, the the, the emotions of the student, mm. all those factors which. You know, AI has got a long, long way to go before it gets anywhere near that. Well, it, you know, it goes with everything. I mean, you know, if you're um, think of a personal trainer, you know, how many people you know download the app for with all the the gym workouts? They can't do it. You know, they you know they get a personal trainer, they make an investment. You know, they invest in in the personal trainer, and they get success. And so it's the same thing in music education. You know, you invest in, in in your education through paying for lessons and you'll get a result. If you do it, the, you know, try and do it cheaply by, you know, finding it online, um, you know, finding the, the how to do it online. Very few people can be successful like that. Um, it's interesting. One of our um, one of our business partners, we don't call our our um, our franchisees, franchisees, we call them business partners because uh, we see that we're in business together. And uh, one of them said, oh, we're putting all the songs up online and the students will be just able to learn them themselves. And, and I said, do you really reckon that's going to happen? <laughs> and, you know, tw 12 months down the track, they're going, when's the next book coming out? Oh, I really want that online as well because <laughs> my yeah. parents love this. <laughs> and it's, you know, we're helping parents because parents are so busy. You know, just how do you, they come, kids come to lessons and they, they go home, they don't practice for three days and they go, oh, I can't remember how to do that. And so this way it's online, it's very easy to access. So it's really great. Yeah. And you're leveraging the technology, but you're not expecting it to take over and replace uh, Absolutely. Yeah, a teacher. That's great. And I, and I think that's, that is really the gap for, for a lot of, People who are trying to sell online courses and trying to do so, they, you know, I think we need to be upfront about that. And and I always do, you know, I often I will say, you know, quite often, uh, don't expect an online course. I even put it in our online courses uh, that our teachers sell. Uh, don't expect this to be a replacement for a teacher because it's not. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a tool. It's something that'll that'll help you, but yeah, it's not a replacement. Mm. No. Exactly, exactly, and that's that's really important for people to realise. Um, the so and but 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 by the same token, um, you know, skyping Skype lessons can also be beneficial. Absolutely, absolutely. and Skype and Skype coaching. Um, uh, I think I might have sent you, or I sent you some information about some of my students. Um, there's a, a video of a little boy who's 12 years old singing and playing Happy, and um, he's uh, he now lives in. Hong Kong, oh, no, Singapore, now it is in Singapore. And he's now uh, 12 and he's playing in the senior in the senior jazz band and they do gigs, you know, at big hotels around Singapore and all this sort of thing. And he's, you know, an amazing little jazz pianist. Um, <clears throat> and I teach him by Skype every fortnight. 
and he's, he's amazing. I'm going, play that again for me. I'm, like, I'm trying to catch up to him these days. <laughs> you're looking, yeah, you're looking for the other, the, the, the piano player in the background who's, who's actually doing the real playing. Yeah. I know. Well, it's as I always say to my students, I want to teach myself out of a job. And I'm doing a pretty good job with him. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. And I think that that's really indicative of a great teacher is when your students you know, when the student becomes the master, so to speak. Uh, mm. That's really, uh, I think, the goal of, of any teacher. And and the thing that, you know, I go back to, and, and, and I was there, I, you know, as a teacher, I was there in those early years when I was, you know, at best an average guitar player. Um, I started learning guitar at, you know, 14, 15, and I was teaching by, by 18, 19. Like, you know, I, I wasn't that <laughs> um, seasoned as a player. Um, but what I did in my teaching is that I was teaching beginners and as I saw them start to get better, I was almost like feeling of holding them back. I was like, well, no, don't get too good. Otherwise I won't have anything to teach you. Um, but I realized, you know, I was probably about 25. I realized that I need to be honest with these students and just say, Hey, um, you, you need to go to another teacher. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not the best person for you. And, and I think once you start doing that, uh, things change as well. So things certainly change for me because I, I found that, uh, they appreciated that, and they also referred students to me. And yeah, there's they, and, and I've seen teachers do it all the time, where they have kind of have this yeah. fear that the students going to outgrow them. Mm, um, mm. Don't have that fear; just let them outgrow you. Encourage them to outgrow. Absolutely, outgrow. absolutely. And I'm, um, you know, I have another one who's who has just started playing gigs, um, the local RSL club up on the northern beaches, and I'm giving him a job on Saturday mornings. He's 14 years old and he's going to work for us on Saturday morning doing all the makeup lessons. And so it's going to make him an even better teacher and better musician because teaching actually does make you a better musician because you have to learn to get it back out. And that's the challenge. So I'm really excited by him doing that. And um, I had another one of my students who just got into um, VCE, um, which is Victorian College of the Arts, um, into the music theatre program. Now he's a great, I taught him from since he was seven, um, and he taught at the music school for the last, while well, he was doing his HSC or year 12. And um, I think that was really great for him, a great experience for him, because he had to really sit down and learn, how do I explain this? You know, he was doing his eighth grade for eighth grade piano, and, um, and also his singing and stuff. So, you know, incredibly talented kid, but just, you know, um, it was a really great experience for him. And that, that will, will put him in good stead because he's going to be in that situation. You know, he's going to need, like, he's not going to get lots and lots of work as a performer. So he's going to need a backup. And, you know, teaching is a great backup and a great secure income for people. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it sometimes it becomes... Uh, preferred choice uh, you know I'm certainly fell into that category I loved performing from a teenager right through to mm. probably my mid-30s but then I got over it I didn't really want to do it anymore um, I, I, I still like performing but I didn't want to be you know excuse the term but I didn't want to be a prostitute to, to the industry I wanted to play on my terms and yeah. if you're relying on the income I said a lot you see musicians who are really desperate relying on not that income so they'll, they'll play anything and they'll play in bands that they hate and they'll play music they hate and uh, and I decided you know really in my mid-20s I decided that I didn't want to keep playing these covers all the time I wanted to do originals and I wanted to do some covers but I wanted to do my own gigs on my yeah. own terms yeah and that's that's exactly right I'm, I was the I was the pianist at David Jones in Brisbane for about five or six years um, and luckily I could play whatever I wanted to play um, and um, but I've uh, you know these days um, you know I, I enjoy I play with in a cabaret show where there's just two of us we do work out the show we write the show we um, get out there and do it we market the show um, we're a big hit in Cootamundra <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the people in Cootamundra. Exactly. I tell you what, um, you know, doing country gigs is, is, you know, it's great because they're desperate for good performances. So, yeah. um, you know, and I've really enjoyed doing the country gigs. They, they're just fantastic. And you make really good money out of it. Um, I, and I totally doing agree. something that you love, you know. 
Yeah. Whereas I find this in the city, especially living in Sydney, I mean, there's so much competition. You know, even the big shows, like I, I got a text message, I sing with them. Um, Symphony Chorus, uh, which is the, the choir that sings with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. I got a text this morning from the Symphony Orchestra. Tonight's the next two night shows, uh, yeah, come and um, you know, buy that ticket half price. You know, it's, they're desperate to get bums on seats. And you know, yeah, wow. it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a shame, but it's a reality that there are so many things on in a big city. Yeah, they're, 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 yeah, because you're competing against all the other things that are going on, you know, international touring artists, football games, uh, you know, lots of sports events, right? There's so much going on where you go to the... Because we, we did that. We used to, you know, this is when I was a teenager, actually. We had a band and we would go up and down the coast. And we because we were so we were young and keen and willing to do any gig that we could get, uh, we were literally getting all these gigs. And and as we, you know, we'd drive down the south coast from Sydney right all the way down to the to Victorian border, playing all those different towns. And, yeah, they, they were so appreciative that, you know, it was incredible how... Mm. Uh, you know, grateful they were. <laughs> to, oh, exactly. Yeah, it's a, it, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I would, you know, recommend for any, especially young band or, or young musician who's looking for gigs, um, stop trying to compete in the city and, and go out to those country gigs and, and you'll probably find that you'll be very welcome. Exactly, yeah. Especially, and it's great for teachers, you know, like you do the weekends, stuff like that. It's That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a, it's a great gig. So in, in terms of advice, on teaching, what advice would you give to a teacher, let's say a young teacher starting out, they're just beginning their teaching in their first stages, what, 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 what are some bits of advice you would give? Keep learning, that would be one of my big ones. Make sure that you put, give yourself a, or identify for yourself um, a professional development strategy um, and find people who you can go and learn from and ask them and don't expect to be paid the big bucks from day one because you won't be um get out there and learn um i have i'm incredibly passionate about professional development um for in the music industry back in, in back in the noughties back in the 2000s because in our industry we have no accreditation anyone can stick up a sign and say i'm a piano teacher i'm a trumpet teacher i'm a guitar teacher i'm a singing teacher yep, yep. so we have no way of having any industry um uh, standardization for um programs i also work in the fitness industry. Um, I have a hobby job, to coaching, running and swimming. You know, I have to go and do professional development. I have to keep my, um, my first aid up to date, my CPR up to date, all that sort of thing. So I think we need to have something like that in the music industry. Um, Absolutely. We tried to do something like that back um, about 15 years ago, 15, 16 years ago, and it just fell on deaf ears totally around the country. And it was such a shame because I think we could really do with a strategy that is vocational training for music teachers in, um, so if anyone has, has got a VTAB um, or a certificate, uh, runs a certificate four program, I'd love to talk to you because <laughs> I've got some great ideas. Um, but there's, there is a friend of mine has just done a PhD on it, in fact, talking about the lack of um, professional development for, for music teachers. So I think what you should do is work out a professional development strategy and go and watch other teachers teach and mm. sit up, ask them if you can sit in on their lessons. To, to observe, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, ask them if you can co-teach with them. Ask them to mentor you. Um, those are the things, uh, you know, that uh, will really help people. Um, and it'll cost you a bit of money. But, hey, you are going to be a better teacher and a better person for that because you've invested in your own learning. Yeah, and it's something that that, that I know that you and, and, and I do, uh, and, and I, I've invested, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in my education over you know a 30-year career and there's not a single uh you know th th there's some there are better investments than others of course but i can't look back at any of that and say well that was a waste of time or money i, I got something yeah. out of every single experience yeah, yeah. Sometimes it was just seeing somebody who was, you know, whether it like being a marketing course or, you know, kind of a snake oil salesperson, just saying, well, mm. this is not the way to do it. 
Okay. So even if you go there and say, well, this is not actually the way to do it. And that's, yeah. and that will happen too. Um, I mean, just this year I've done um, a three day neuropedagogy course through UTS. I've done the offshore, excuse me, New South Wales conference. In July, I'm going to the Music Teachers Association of California's conference. Condoleezza Rice is the keynote speaker, which is wow. pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, I'm then going to NAM, which I'm speaking at, but I will also be going to see all the other speakers. I'm uh, presenting at a um, piano workshop called 88 Keys in Denver, Colorado, but I will get to see all the other people. And then I'm going to the National Keyboard Pedagogy Conference in Chicago, which is a four-day conference on piano pedagogy, which is, it's, I mean, it's fantastic. And that's, the, I mean, that's a real investment in my professional development. And sure, you don't have to go across the world to do it. You know, in Australia, the Australian Society of Music Educators are running a conference in Adelaide later this year. So it's, you know, it, these are really great opportunities for people to learn. And um, there are heaps of other little groups that run lots of professional development all over the place. And if you can key into those sorts of things, you will really get some distinct benefits. I know with the um, sort of the off um, lessons, they are very classroom based. So often they're great for guitarists um, because they're playing guitars and ukuleles and stuff. So from a piano teaching perspective, I, most people go, oh, why would you do that? Because they're not playing piano. And it's like, yeah, but you can transfer those skills over to piano. You might not be able to do exactly the same thing, but all learning is beneficial and you take something. Um, I was doing a, um, uh, did this fantastic body percussion thing, which is, you know, totally not any instrument, just your body. And um, came home and um, wrote a new song that we're um, in in seven eight, um, which is you know it's a pretty tricky time signature, and I've just started teaching it to my to my students and trialing it out, and I've um, just got a great backing track for it. And going, I think wow, I only know one song in seven eight. This, <laughs> <laughs> but it's great it. to explore different time signatures. It is, you know? it is, and, yeah. and so and you know you get ideas and you go oh, you know. What I did, I couldn't use, but what it gave me was an impetus to learn to do something new. And so you can really use that material. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and, and really, you know, I think uh, to just to add to what you're saying there, which is, you know, about getting educated, not just, uh, you know, teaching. And this is what happens, especially in the guitar space. And I know that there's a lot of guitar teachers out there who are very guilty of this, of where they teach and, you know, let's say preach, but they don't practice. They, they're not actually learning anywhere. They're not students of, or, or you know, some of them, are, a lot of them are self-taught even. So they've never even had a teacher. They don't go to any courses. They don't involve in any kind of study. And it's almost like this kind of cowboy approach to, to teaching where I don't want to be tainted by the industry. I want to be you know, I, I know what I'm doing, where I'm going, and, and that's nice, but unfortunately, uh, it isolates you from from learning. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, always, I always say to, to teachers, put yourself in a new learning situation. So about four years ago, um, the cabaret show I play, we, we do, we take a, um, a, like a show, we do, we have a show called The Sound of Music. Uh, it's the music spelt with a K. And um, the my colleague, Paul, he does all of the characters. <laughs> so he, he plays three nuns. He plays the captain and the captain sings Maria. I just cut, I just met a girl named Maria from West Side Story. So it's a whole mashup of different right, yeah, songs. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it, it's just a fantastic show. So we, we wrote this new Grease show, which is a very similar thing. So it's the whole story of Grease. He does all the characters. Um, and um, he does, he's very clever because he'll do a boy and a girl at the same time with like a half um, thing where he'll sing the boy part and then sing the girl part. And he sings the girl part in falsetto. So it's quite a So he kind of puts makeup on either side. <laughs> well, he doesn't actually use any makeup. All he does is just use props. So he'll use right. like half a hairband or something like that. Yep. So it's very funny. Um, but he said, you have to sing backup. And I'm like, Mm, really? He's going, yeah, you've got to go on singing lessons because we have to have sing we have to have backup because <laughs> you've got to have doo-wops. <laughs> so I went and had singing lessons. And 
you know, four weeks after I started, I went, oh my God, I've just had the realization. Because, you know, if, I, if you imagine the whole of your computer screen is all the information about singing, well, there's one pixel, which is about all the stuff that I know about singing. And there's a pixel either side of that pixel of all of the stuff that I know I don't know. And then the whole rest of the screen is all the stuff I don't know that I don't know. <laughs> and I had, the, I had the realization of, oh my God, there is so much I don't know that I don't know. <laughs> and I was literally ready to give up. And I thought, oh, I've got to do this. And, and I have, I've been learning for four years. I even did, I did my grade eight classical singing exam. I got an A for it. I'm doing my diploma in classical singing just for the fun of it. Um, but I had this whole realization of, Oh my God, this is what it's like. And I'm a reasonable musician. Imagine mm -hmm. what it's like if you weren't. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's easy. And, and, and I think one of the advantages that I have of, of being a teenage beginner, and, mm. and I've spoken to other you know, teachers who relate to this, is that I remember what it was like. I remember mm. that experience and how mm. scary and intimidating and uh, the mm. doubts and the, and the and what I call the emotional roller coaster of like, I'm not made to do this. I'm not a drummer because I started on drums. So mm. this, I just don't have it. I just don't have any the, the skills or coordination to do this. Thinking mm. all the time, believing, and I think this is one of the big myths that's really hard to get through to kids. I, and, you know, it's almost like it's built into us because my eight-year-old daughter, even with her, I tell her that, you know, I keep pushing the message that, you learn. This is how you get good at things. People learn when you see someone who really talented at something. It's because they practiced it. It's not because they were born genetically. You know, I do. I do believe, by the way, that there are some genetic advantages that people have. Mm. Certain mm. things that come. We, we've seen it. We, you know, as a teacher, you experience it every now and again. But number one, it makes no difference. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, uh, the best players in the world practiced. You, you will not find a great musician anywhere who didn't practice to get there. Mm. Uh, they may have started, you know, if we say it's a, you know, a race, they might have started f from, you know, 20 metres in front of you. But at the end of the day, it's the person who keeps training and going and pushing mm. that ends up becoming. Mm. And it's not about another mm. person either. It's about you achieving you know, your own mm. musical ambitions, whatever they happen to be. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think it's um, very easy to... Uh, forget these things, if you know what mm, I mean. Mm, mm. Uh, yeah, and, I mean, just on that note of, of practice, getting kids to practice, it's, it's a real challenge to, you know, we compete with soccer. I mean, we don't really compete with other music teachers. We compete with soccer and ballet and futsal and, so and um, what else do they do? Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu <laughs> Swimming, <laughs> training. Oh, yeah. I know, it's just you know so it. much. Like, I have... Kids, I couldn't practice this, but I was too busy. Yeah, and they're eight, they're eight years old. I'm too busy. Yeah. And then you ask them, how much time did you spend on the iPad? Oh, three hours a day. All right, <laughs> so yeah, no time. You, yeah, you can actually look right. You look at the time they spend on a, a device. Exactly. And, yeah. and it's really, you know, I think one of the important things is really helping parents. Um, you know, as a teacher, your job should be to help parents manage the lives of their children because you know what is required, but also it really helps the kids understand effort equals rewards. Because if they don't put the effort in, they're not going to get the rewards. And yep. so if you can establish that, that um, practice regime from a young age, they're, they're in it. And I, you know, I've had parents um, with 15 year old daughters and going, thank God for the piano, because the piano gets it and we don't. <laughs> Yep. Good. You know, good. so you, you've, you've given that child an outlet. You know, they, yes. can, they can put, you know, with the drums, they can put their headphones on and hit the crap out of the drum kit. <laughs> um, or they can, you know, play their guitar, you know, and especially with headphones and stuff, they can play it as loud as they like, you know, and get their frustrations out. And that is what music's all about. You know, yeah. it's, it's really about, it's lifestyle, isn't it? It is. It absolutely is. And and what you're saying there, the rewards that come from it. Sometimes the you know they don't realise those rewards until mm. sometimes years later, or, or you know through other means. Like my daughter, when she you know she 
joined a new school because we were in Japan last year. We came to this, and, and she went and she auditioned for the school choir. Now they have two choirs. They have a, a normal choir, then they have what they call the Excellence Choir. And she came home really excited and said, "I got in the Excellence Choir." Um, it's like, wow, what's that mean? And she said, oh, it's just only a handful of kids get selected each year to go into yeah, the excellence yeah. choir. Uh, and they use the best kids. I said, well, that's fantastic. Well done. And I said, why do you think that happened? And she said, um, I don't know. And I said, it's because you've been learning music. You've got an ear. She's got a great ear, right? She's got a better ear than I have at eight years of age. Um, and she, she's got this developed musical ear because I started teaching her at three. And yeah. So, so I said, because of your ear, sweetie, you're able to pitch really well, uh, you know, and you, and so they recognize that the teachers recognize that and say, well, this girl can do the job. So let's mm. put her in the band mm. in, in the choir. Um, and, mm. and so she, that gives her a confidence boost. It makes her feel, uh, mm. you know, it, it builds her self esteem. So there are all these extra benefits that the, yeah, that we absolutely have. just on the ear thing, the, um, you know, you know, that the ear is fully developed at, uh, by the age of eight. Um, so if you can get children involved in music from a young age, they will have significant oral benefits. Yeah, which is interesting because when I, uh, you know, and, and I was kind of a voice for this in that most guitar teachers, and I'm talking probably 90% of guitar teachers, would recommend that students start take up guitar from age of seven onwards. I'm, I'm sure you've yeah. heard of that, right? Mm. Um, and so what you've just missed the best part <laughs> um, well see we, we teach guitar as well we are, and we do recommend that because we want them in a piano class before that <laughs> you've got an ulterior motive exactly <laughs> we well the pro the thing with guitar is it for, from my perspective um as a as an educator i i see this is hard to see and this whereas a piano you, you can you look at the note you can play the note and you can see the note and so it's just from a from a from an educational perspective, um, it's a it's a probably a little bit more appropriate instrument. Um, not taking away from your guitar teachers at all, though. <laughs> no, no, no. Look, uh, uh, there there are students that you know. So we take them from four, but we would say to parents because sometimes parents say you know they've got a two year old or whatever, and they say uh, you know can they start from two? And I say, well, you could in theory it could be done, but the, you're better off going and doing an early development course, getting them onto yeah. you know something like that. Where they're going to be around their age group, their own age group, and there'll be other parents there, and then come back and do guitar, you know, when they're four. Yeah. Um, but don't don't hold them back from music in any way. Mm. Um, exactly, you know, they've got to be involved somewhere. And like like you, you know, the point you made of ear before eye, and, and that's you know, get them out there um, training the ears. Because if you look at say mm. Suzuki, right, which is what inspired me initially to put the G four guitar method together, uh, Suzuki would for training them in the womb, right? They go and buy the cassettes and you play it. Um, um, and it was just, I thought, well, they're really, and, and if you look at Suzuki students, they've got great ears, um, that there are weaknesses in the course as well, but there are in everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that, that I looked at that and I thought, well, there's something in that and so getting them in early. And that's when I started to really look at, I thought if a, a two-year-old can get onto a violin, then we can surely get them younger than seven on guitars. So. Exactly. Well, we we have we start children from six months at Forte. With that, we have a jungle music program, which is for six months to three and a half. So, and they're all streamed into ages. Um, so, yeah, right. Um, and, I mean, I've got kids who are eight now, who have been learning since they were six months, and they're doing grade three piano. They're like, and they eat yeah. it up, and we, you know. Um, they sing, they compose their own songs, they play jazz, they're just, they're so, <laughs> so musical. Wow. One little girl who's, who's in the um, Sydney Children's Choir, I think she's in, and she said, uh, she comes in everywhere, oh, Mr. Paul, I've written a, a new song, and, and it's <laughs> like, she's like a, a little Adele. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> you know? um, all the right chords, and, all, and, and the other thing is she said, she'll play in whatever key. But just doesn't she just fingers just move? It's just it, it astounds me. Absolutely. I, 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 me. I think what that shows uh, is that we've underestimated children. I think for a long time, mm. right? Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, we, we we you know we go back to these kind of prodigies as we, we used to call them, a Mozart or or you know over the years has been you know these different musical prodigies. Um, but we don't realise that a lot of that comes from, you know, if we look in the guitar kind of realm, when we think about players, 
like uh, you know Van Halen, who were very popular amongst rock guitar players. Um, you know those those guys. Their father was a, a traveling musician. They started on. They actually both of the. I don't know if you know this, but the Van Halen brothers both did classical music. They used to go and do classical piano, uh, classical piano. Sorry, um, they did classical piano and used to go and do competitions. Um, mm. when they were, but the thing is that they couldn't read music. Um, and they were, they had, they'd get these pieces of music, and they were supposed to be reading them. But they used to fake it. They used to memorize it all, mm. <laughs> and then go wow, and play yeah. it. Most of, most good um, musicians, contemporary musicians, have a classical music history in there yes. somewhere. Um, I, I think it's Ivor Davies from Ice House. He's yes, Ivor his, Davies. Yes, yep, he played Amos Oboe or something. Oboe, Oboe. That's it. Oboe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Amos in in Oboe. So you, you know, you get especially. Um, Certainly with piano, you get facility, I'd imagine, with guitar as well. Studying classical guitar, you would get great technical facility um, from it. But also, I mean, I was just talking to one of my kids, that little boy that lives in Hong Kong. He's going, oh, I don't want to do my seventh grade exam. No, 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 classical music. And so, and I'm playing, a, um, singing a Schubert, a Schum yeah, Schubert song from um, uh, a, a song cycle. And, you know, it's a, it's a quite a well-known song cycle, but it's you know people would think, oh, it's you know it's Schubert, Schubert and it's boring. And I played him this bit, and I, I said, oh, that's really classical. And I said, but what if you did this to it? And I played the same thing with different with, with a with a beat. And he goes, that sounds cool. And I went, that's why you got to learn classical. They had really great ideas. <laughs> it is. It's you know you, 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 there's a lot of music a lot of popular music yeah it's inspired you know you, you have to think of bands like queen right queen were very inspired Absolutely. by classical yeah. music um I, I, even abba abba you know they yeah. they apparently took most of those you know uh you know waterloo and dancing queen and all those big hits that they had were taken from from classical kind of you know uh, ideas so yeah. yeah absolutely well um you know a perfect example is um uh, Go West, you know, um, by well, yes. Pet Shop Boys, yes. but what, what, um, what are they called? Not YMCA, what's it? What are the name? The Village, Village people. people, yep. yep. Uh, that's just Parker Bell's Canon, you know. There you go. It, it's exact, it is exactly the same chord progression as Parker Bell's Canon, and you know, everyone knows Parker Bell's Canon. And you go, How did you know it was also this? And you play them a bit of Go West, they go. That's the village people. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Where, where would the Beatles have been without George Martin, right? He was exactly a classical musician. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it's undeniable, and and I think that you know even in in, in rock circles we have guys like Inge Malmsteen and and whatever who were considered neoclassical guitar players, right? Mm. Um, in other words, they're playing rock. That and and his favorite composer uh, was Bach. So you know, and, and Bach has influenced a lot of guitar players. Uh, he, you know, the, the lines, and the, the, you know, the runs and, and the arpeggios and all that from Bach are just—it's uh, awesome material. You can just spend a whole lifetime using Bach as an inspiration for writing your own guitar lines. Well, and if you and if you're not into Bach, then just get on onto YouTube and, and look up Flying Bach, uh, which is the um, what's the the power drink called? Um, the, oh not, yeah, with wings, uh, right, Red Bull. Yeah, yeah. Red Bull. Yeah, yeah. Red, just Google or, or look on YouTube. Bark Red Bull, uh, flying Bark Red Bull. The guys break dance to um, to two pianists, or actually a pianist and a harpsichord player playing Bark. It is amazing. Wow! I went and saw them live in Sydney. I'll be checking was, that out for sure. Yeah. Blew my mind. <laughs> it was fantastic. I went. This is what classical music is all about. This is why, you know, we need to, people need to play classical music, but do something different with it. You know, put some technology behind it, you know, do, have the orchestra, but have an amazing video that's behind it. So you get this whole video and music experience. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I love about the classical kind of education, if you like, and that's where I got a lot of my inspiration from as a teacher, is that in, in, it, there's just a lot more structure there in in the in the world of learning guitar. It was very unstructured. Um, it was mm. all about oh, what what song do you want to learn, and, and mm. it's just going with the flow, going with the mood of, of mm. you know the teacher and the student. But where is all this going? And and I you know I went to lots of guitar teachers, and I always felt like 
I wasn't going anywhere. Like, well, mm -hmm. where does this all end up? Whereas with classical teachers, and because I worked with a lot of classical teachers, I would watch them and, and see how they worked, the very structured way of learning. They had grades and, and certain mm -hmm. skills that you had to achieve. And, and I love that. I thought, wow, that's what I need. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. I owe a lot to the, to the classical world. Yeah. Um, sorry, did you want to add anything? No, there? no, I was just, I was yeah. just going to say, you know, um, we're, we've been going a fair while now. Did you, is there anything else that you wanted to? I just wanted about? to, yeah, just what, what I wanted to do is just touch on the business side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, spend a bit of time on that. And then, um, so, so how do you, if we look at marketing as an example, how do you find students? What are some tips you could give for teachers trying to find new students? I well um, have have yourself a website. Make sure it's um, uh, mobile friendly, mobile, optimized for mobile phones. Um, Facebook page. Um, be friends on Facebook with all your students. Um, you know, and don't post your whole life on Facebook. You know, um, some things. If you wouldn't tell it to your mother, then don't put it on Facebook. Yep. You know? yep. Don't, don't show your political preferences, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, if you if you hate um, uh, Tony Abbott or whoever, you know, or Malcolm Turnbull or Bill Shorten, whoever's in in power, um, or what's his name, or Trump. Trump. Keep, yes. People love keep, to hate Trump. Yep. Keep it to yourself because yes. you know, polit and also about religion, you know, and sex, you know. The, the, like, the, the, the normal, the basics, yeah. Sex, yeah, really, religion, yeah. politics, and then, money. And then you can be friends with your clients and and then you can tag your clients and, and you know, ask parents, you know, oh, my gosh, um, you know, Johnny played that beautifully. Is it all right for me to um, to take a video of it? Because I'm so proud of what he's done. I'd, like, I'd love to put it on Facebook to show everyone how good he is. And can I, is that okay? And can I tag them? You know, always ask permission. But it, that is, it's gold. Yep. You know, that sort of stuff is really gold. So I think, you know, um, and that, that's the biggest, one of the biggest challenges with social media is often people can't hold themselves back. Um, and so one of the things that I, I, I never comment on anything political I never even like anything political. I might agree with it or I might not agree with it, but I never comment on it. I just read it, that's it. Um, so I, you know, because I work with people in every sort of um, environment, you know? So yep. you just don't know what your views, how your views will affect others' perception of you. Yeah, yeah, because they do. It's, a, it's an association. If you put up a thing saying that I like this person or I hate this person, then people immediately go on the defensive or, or go on the attack. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. You're drawing, you're drawing yeah, barriers between you and potential students mm. and, and relationships. Yeah. yeah, I totally understand. I, I, I think that a, a good kind of rule of thumb is to think about your students and whether or not you run a safe Facebook page. So if I'm a parent of a 10 year old and I'm looking at your Facebook page, do I feel comfortable looking at what you're putting on your Facebook page for my 10 year old child to be learning with you? Absolutely, that's exactly right, yes. Excellent. Uh, so I've, any, got, yeah, I've, I've, got, I've, got, I've just got to, I've put my computer on, um, on not, not on my uh, power, so I'm going to have to get power in a, in about a minute or two. <laughs> go, go now, go now. Um, Is that all right? I'll yeah, be go, get, get, go and get your power, yeah, and I'll, I'll keep it busy. So... So uh, what I want to do while Paul's doing that is, is just to quickly talk about your Facebook page. You can really leverage your Facebook page. Start with the students you have and make friends with them. If there's things on your Facebook page that you don't want them to see, maybe clean that up first, delete those posts off, go back and have a look through. You don't have to go through your whole history, but maybe go th back through your last six months and look at the, the pictures that are in the side there and click on them just to make sure. And just keep it yeah really clean and take away any of those pictures of you when you're drunk on a Friday night um, and and try and use your Facebook page as a platform for representing who you are. Think of think of like a politician or you know someone who's an important person in the community. They're not going to paste 
post pictures up of themselves in these things. You, you even look at, say, sports players today. Sports players have a huge responsibility to be what we would consider respectable people in the community. And so whether you want to be that person or not, that's your choice. If you want to go and be a rock star, that's great. Do that. But if you want to be an educator, especially of children, then you really want to make sure that you clean up your Facebook page. So once you've cleaned that up, the next step is then to go to your current students and start inviting them to be friends of yours. Just ask them first, because some people aren't comfortable with that, just to say, um, look, and, and be straight up and say, look, I use my Facebook page as a way of communicating with my students. So, mm. uh, yeah, if I put that up, et cetera. Um, Paul's back now. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's all right. Um, all right, so, so yeah, so I'm just sort of giving tips on, on how they can do. So have you got any other tips on on marketing, thinking of the, kind of the beginner teacher starting out, is there anything else that you would recommend they do? Yeah, I would go and um, make some friends in, in the community. So I go and speak to the local church, you know, put some flyers up, um, posters up. It's, you know, it, it's a snowball effect, isn't it? You know, the, the first, your first student is your hardest student to get. You know, your 10th student is probably the easiest student to get. And, you know, work out what, what it is that you want to do and what you can offer. But also your students will, uh, I know, we know with Forte, um, I mean, last year we had 2,762 um, trial lesson requests across our network in just in Australia. So that's 14 locations um, in 12 months, so from our website. So that's a lot of requests for lessons. Fantastic. And thank you for sharing a stat because, you know, I know that they're your, uh, you know, business stats. So I hope the guys here who are listening are taking that in. Yeah, that's great. Um, so we, um, we have, um, and we know, so therefore we know that 35% of our inquiries come from word of mouth. So that's someone re recommending us. So that might be a friend or a family, friend, friend they've heard from you from a friend or, or someone within their family. So that's a third, more than a third. Of that's huge. Inquiries that's huge. Yeah. Are coming from people who are already existing clients. So you need to make sure, one, you're a good teacher. Two, you are put, putting things in place to make sure that everyone understands how their students, where, where they're heading. You know, are we heading to a concert? Are we heading to a performance? Are we heading towards an exam? What you're heading towards. So that parents love to know that there are little signposts along the way that they can say, oh, well, Johnny just did his grade two um, rock school guitar and, you know, mm -hmm. oh, my, my child's only done grade one. I'll have to go and talk to my teacher about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then celebrate that fact. You know, tell, tell your, you know, again, on Facebook, I heard you say, you know, ask parents if they'd like to be your friend on Facebook. And, and a great strategy is to, as you said, to say to them, oh, I use Facebook to communicate. Would you be happy with me being your friend on Facebook? I'll send you a, you know, please friend me. Um, and then ask the parent if you can take a photo of their child and congratulate them because it's a really great achievement and celebrate that. So those sorts of things make a huge amount of difference. Absolutely, absolutely. So, that, so, so, so from what, what I'm gathering there is that 35% is a, is a big score, by the way, uh, and, and I know that it's easy for us to um, take guesses at this, but the thing with what you do, Paul, is you keep very close stats on everything. Is that true? We do. All of um, our, uh, because of our, we, <laughs> we have just named our, um, our FileMaker program because it's a CRM, CRM so Customer Relationship Module. Um, she's just been named Doris. So it is our daily organisational real-time information system. So Doris keeps, Doris gets sent all of the inquiries. Um, so when they come into our system, they come in and pop up in the particular schools. They activate that um, and then they follow that up, which is usually a telephone call. I always try to encourage our, our business partners to actually talk to people. Don't, don't communicate by email or by Facebook. 
Yep. Pick Any, up anyone who knows me is exactly the same. Get on the phone. <laughs> Pick up the telephone and say hello because you are building relationship. You, it's We talked about being a, a great teacher before and it's great teachers that interact with students. It's the same thing. You need to interact with the parent and they and that builds trust for with that person. And the other thing is that you can ask some questions. You know, you can't, like, by the time you do, a, you know, an email exchange and things can just be um, misunderstood so easily. You could say, oh, we don't do this. And, and they go, oh, well, that means they don't do any of the things that I thought they do. Um, so, but if you're having a conversation, like we're having a conversation, I could say, oh, we don't teach classical guitar, but we do teach um, you know, rock guitar, we teach this guitar. And we're, the reason we don't that because at this age, children don't seem to enjoy it that much because there's a lot of, but we do teach classical when they're 15 because when they've done or whatever, I'm just making it yeah. up. But yep. do you know what I mean? Yeah, you, absolutely. You, you, you actually can build a relationship and you can explain why, but also you could all find out why they want to know. Yeah. So you go, you know, like, I mean, the common question is, um, do you have piano lessons, you know, or how much are your piano lessons, you know? Yes. And you go, um, you know, 25 95 and they go, okay, thanks, because they know around the corner they get someone for 20 bucks or whatever it is, um, you know. So it, then they're buying on price. You want to get away from buying on price because in business there's three things in business. There's price, quality and service. You're never, ever going to get all three. So you're it's two out of three, right? It's two out of three. So we never go for price. We always go for quality and service. So if you walk into a four-day school, they look immaculate. We have um, a hashtag called crisp and clean, which is um, one of the things that we always talk about. Do, is your school crisp and clean? Does it look pristine? Um, I was telling you about that girl who um, uh, I think could be the next Adele and has been learning since she was six months. And her mum said to me last year, you know why we came here, don't you? And I said, because I'm such a fabulous teacher. And she went, oh, no. <laughs> and I went, oh, really? Sorry, no. <laughs> Sorry, no. She said they came because uh, in our baby program, anything that goes in a child's mouth gets, we tell the parents, oh, look, if it goes in your child's mouth, just let us know. We'll stick it in our special to-be-cleaned bucket. So, And we clean them with antiseptic cleaning wipes. And that was the whole decision, the purchasing decision, to come to music lessons. That parent has probably spent something like twelve to thirteen thousand dollars over the last seven or eight years on that child. Yeah. And not to mention referrals, right? Add that Absolutely, to uh, exactly. So then there's all the referrals, all because we cleaned the instruments when she was six months old. Yeah. Yep. It, it's and, and it's an emotional decision that the mother feels safe. You know, there's obviously, you know, if it's clean, it's safe. Um, and look, my, my wife, as you know, is Japanese. Uh, she's that that would be definitely a a deal breaker for her if you if things weren't clean, if she thought that it was unsanitary in any way, um, she wouldn't go near. Uh, and, and, you know, she's very particular about that kind of thing. My wife is so particular that when we go to a hotel room, she actually cleans the room. Um, that's, and I'm not that's kidding. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> so half the reason we're here, sweetie, so we don't have to clean. Um, yeah, she doesn't trust them. She's got to do it. So the the yeah, those little things, and I think you know that that's a big takeaway here. That in business, it's so easy to get wrapped up in in the so the marketing in terms of putting big ads in in you know whether it be on Facebook or Google or whatever. Yet that's only a very small part of your your overall marketing yeah. campaign, right? Exactly. I, I um you know I'm saying a third of my well more than a third of my inquiries come from word of mouth. So that means looking after your existing clients, and then you can also um you know resell to your existing clients so for example we have um when the students do um start to get to old enough to be do i do exams they also do a private lesson so they do a class lesson and a private lesson um we do theory classes um you know we do they might come have a singing group or something like that so there's lots of ways that you can actually generate more income 
from your existing students. But also, you know, you're not ripping the students off. You're actually giving them a better, you know, no, a, a more you... rounded education as well. Yeah. And again, that will build you more students. So um, I think, you know, obviously there's the standard things of, you know, doing fa Facebook um, marketing um, and Facebook marketing is a challenge and you should really either educate yourself or get someone to help you. Um, can, can I just say just before we move on to that because it's a great topic but just one more thing on what you're talking about with the students have you yeah. done numbers on uh, how many dollars of income come from referrals if you know what I mean so uh, yeah, I know it's a kind of a a bit of a dig, but the, the point that I'm kind of making, and I think that, that you would find this, is that that there, there's there's not, even though a third of your student, 35% referral, uh, you will find that those referrals end up being better students, true? Ten, they tend to be, yes. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So proportionally, they spend more money. It could be as much as 50% of your profits come from... Well, especially in my school where I have a waiting list on my waiting list, so... Um, and uh, so, you know, some you get a, you know, for good teachers, um, you know, it means that you can, you can almost, you can call the shots a bit better. Like if a student comes in for a assessment and, you know, they'll bend over backwards to come to a particular class. They'll go, oh, we've got baseball on then. Oh, so that's the only class I've got. Oh, it's okay. We'll move up baseball. You know, yes. <laughs> like, okay, like, they, yep. you, you can get, you can, you, you, you can, you know, when you have, if you are good at what you do, you you have more control over your own destiny. So um, that helps a lot. Which leads back to our original conversation about getting educated, getting better at what you do. Um, yeah. So you, know, you do become that kind of teacher. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's all intertwined, isn't it? Really, you know. It's a full circle. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's you know, be a good teacher, be be a good marketer. And everything will it, the the pie will get bigger for you. Yeah, um, yeah. And you, so, as a consequence, because when we look at that investment return on investment, when you and this is what I talk about is ROI, right? So for every dollar that you spend on marketing, knowing that you're going to get a student who's going to stay and then refer three more students who will then also refer another student or two. Yeah. Um, so that one one student, and I call I used to call them the fifty thousand dollar student. That one student could be worth fifty thousand dollars. What's the cost to acquire that student? Maybe a hundred dollars mm. in marketing. That's a pretty good return in any investment circles. Hundred dollars and fifty Absolutely. grand back. So, yeah, and just you know, and really committing. Um, I mean, we we recommend four to five percent of your income committing to marketing and promotion. So you know, really committing that sort of amount for growth. Uh, I mean, some of our music schools have got, um, well, one of them has got nearly a thousand students um, in it. We have music schools around seven, eight hundred, five hundred, and people build their music school to the size that they're comfortable as a business to run. Because obviously, when it comes to running a um, a, a business, the bigger the business, the more he the headaches. So you yep. have to be comfortable running the business that you you are running. Um, so, uh, for example, I, I used to run um, a school the size of 700 students back in the, all through the 90s. Um, when I moved to Sydney, I decided, you know, 300 is enough, you know, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be involved in the running of it. So I'm just a teacher there. So I don't actually run my business. I have a full-time manager who does the job. So the other thing to remember is what do you want to do at the end of that? You know, do you want to sell your business or, and just working out a strategy. One of the books that we read before we started Forte was called, ah, the, oh, I have to come back. <laughs> I just lost his name. It'll come back to me in a second. But it, um, it was talking about basically franchising yourself, the E-Myth. The E-Myth, yeah. I thought By you were going to that way. Michael the, Gerber. By Marco Gerber, yes. Yep. And um, I think it's now called the E-Myth Revisited now. But yes. the process that, that he recommends is that you basically set yourself up to be replicable so or to be able to be franchised. And so that's how we've run our, our business so that we're able to replicate again and again and again. And the, and the replication is a copy, um, but not a photocopied copy, a copy so yes. we have 
Hopefully, that, a new and improved copy, right? <laughs> absolutely, and and we and we've even seen it. You know, it's it again. You know, I think my my the the, the highest number of students I had in, in in my school at any point one point in time was about eight hundred and twenty one or something like that. Um, you know, which I think we were there for like two days <laughs> before we lost a student or something. Because yep, yep. um, of course, you know, when you lose ten percent of your students or you know five percent of your students, that's forty people. It's like you, you feel like putting ice cubes in your mouth and just holding this and just drinking from the scotch bottle <laughs> when that happens. Um, so don't, don't, don't paste that on Facebook, by the way, guys. <laughs> that's right. Do not paste that on Facebook. Um, but you know, so even small percentages at that at that big size feel, um, uh, you know, really quite impact on how you feel about your business. But you've got to put it into context because if you only had a, a studio of 80 students, that would just be four students. So that's a lot less to deal with. So um, going down that, that path, you know, we, we've, again, as a teacher, I want to teach myself a job. As a business owner or and a, a business um, sort of franchisor, uh, working with our franchisees, I want to. I would love them to be more successful than, than me. You know, as a as a franchisee, and yep. I, and we've seen it. You know, like we, we've got one of our guys in Perth with nearly a thousand students. He's been going for ten years. Just brilliant business, brilliant yep. business. You know, and he's taken on. Um, you know, and his background is he worked for Coca Cola. You know, he was he learnt piano, went to the con and went, oh, my God, what am I going to do for a job? And then he went, oh, I'll go work for Coca-Cola. <laughs> but a passionate muso, you know, still plays and, and stuff. So well, that's the thing. If you can find that that combination and that's where, the, the you know, in your case, the franchising has worked and I guess in my case as well, is that when you find that client who who, you know, takes your system with both hands but then works it to the max, um, mm. Beyond probably what you would have, um, you know. Mm. I know that I've got uh, teachers who within G four who are they're just going harder than I ever went, um, you know. And and that's just because different people have different strengths and different mm. personalities. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's great to see the success. Um, so it's it's fantastic. Excellent. So. We, and we'll wrap up it very shortly. I know we've taken a lot of your time today, but um, what were you going to say about Facebook ads? Have you done some yourself? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've done a lot of Facebook ads, um, a lot of Facebook marketing, um, which is uh, it's it's challenging. Mm, it's always changing, right? It's, 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 I was just about to say it's always bloody changing. <laughs> <laughs> like, where did that button go? <laughs> um, yep. That in itself is like a real challenge because you um, you go. Oh my God, I've got no idea what just happened. Um, but just, you know, setting up your market and stuff. So really educate yourself because you can you can blow a lot of money. We blew a lot, I blew a lot of money on Google AdWords about two years ago. I, went, oh, I know what I'm doing. Bang. Bang. Thousand bucks a day. Well, yep. well, it wasn't quite that much, but, you know, it was about $1,500 later. I went, oh, Jesus, that's been the worst, you know, what a waste of money that's been. Yep. And so get an expert to help you or educate yourself. There's plenty of online training um, for that sort of stuff. Heaps. And, heaps or work, yeah. with a, work with someone and say, I want you to show me what you're doing. I want to learn how to do this for myself and be upfront. They might charge you a bit more, but gosh, you know, you'll, you've actually learned something and you, and you can be in control. That's the thing I, I like. You know, I want to be in control of what's happening, so I want to learn how to do it. Yeah, yeah, and and you don't even need to know all the bells and whistles of any of those platforms. Yeah, you just need someone who can sort of guide you through. Because if time is money, which it is in business, uh, you know, you can spend uh, hours and hours and hours trying to work things out. So I, I went to a whole bunch of seminars, and I'm so glad I did because I just learnt the shortcuts um, and saved a lot of time. Plus, I had a, a rep. I don't know if you had, but I, with Facebook, I had a Facebook rep for a while because of the amount yeah. of spending. Um, yeah. and she was very helpful as well. So. Yeah, it does make a difference. I mean, Facebook do make it easy, obviously. But that's in their vested interest to make it easy for you. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, so in terms of an ad, look, to give more specifics to, to, to teachers, is there, are there some tips as a kind of ad you use? Like I talk about lead ads. Do you, are there particular ads that you use, types? 
Well, it depends on what who you're targeting, I think. You know, so you're, um, I don't know, I, I'm not sort of experienced in targeting the um, sort of guitar market. We, we tend to target the early childhood market. So um, we're targeting mums who are looking to do something educational with their child. So it's about telling that story. Um, video ads, I think, are really important. Um, but they've got to be slick. Like, yes. you, if you're going to do, I mean, we had, we've just had um, a videographer just do an, um, like a two minute sort of thing for each of our music schools. And it was expensive, but so worthwhile because everyone has really, really great footage that they can now use about their business. Yeah. And that is a really key thing because when, um, when you've got stuff, if it doesn't look good, you're never going to sell. People aren't going to buy stuff that doesn't look good. There's too much competition, right? There's too many yeah. other things going on. Yeah, and if if you have that slick video, you 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 have that presentation. It's 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 like everything, you know. The, yeah, and it's not even that it's that slick, but it's been well produced. Yeah, yeah. Good lighting, good sound, good. Yeah, the the angles are right. All those kind of things. Yep. Yeah, and you've got to you've got to identify. I think in what does what are you trying to sell? What is it? What is the essence of what you're selling? And uh, I know for us with the early childhood, because we literally grow our, our own students. If we can get kids in at six months, we can keep them for ten years. You know, and they keep coming back. And they might come in for six months and then go do swimming, but we'll keep telling them about all the benefits of music. You know, having yeah. music lessons. So, if you're, so we want to se sell that message that tells them that this is a really valuable investment in their child's education. Fantastic. And anyone who's in music can sell that same message. It's an investment in your child's education because yep. all of all the skills that they will learn. Yep. And and, what, and, what, sorry, go. On. Yep. Oh, I was just going to say, my purpose in life is get more people playing music for longer you know yeah. so educate people so that they learn music and play for longer because it's it's a common well, trait that, that i've seen amongst you know very successful music teachers it, it is that kind of core belief that playing a musical instrument it's not just uh, hey, I like playing music or, or, you know, I can sell a few lessons and make a bit of money so I can keep playing music. It's, it's actually that belief that music is good for you. It, it's, it's like healthy food or good water or a good education of any kind. Um, and so, yeah, again, that's what I'm seeing in you is that that core belief. And I, I know I challenge teachers if they don't have that core belief in their teaching that, that maybe that's blocking their ability to be successful because I think there's a – it comes through in everything you do, right? It comes through in your marketing, your selling. Absolutely. You know, teaching. Yeah. So you got it, and that's where you, you're making the investment as well. Is that you have no qualms about going and spending a couple of thousand dollars on a ticket to fly to US to do a course, uh, you know, and knowing that that's going to make you a better teacher because therefore you can give back more, which is your core mission in life. So. Yeah, exactly. And you know, if you make the choice to do something like that, tell people about it. No, it's a great marketing strategy. You know, I'm investing in my own professional development by going to. Yep. So that, which means that I will be a better teacher for your your child. Exactly. Exactly. And and that's you know I, I do the same. I, I well I can tell an experience. I went to my dentist, and and this is a guy in Chatswood, and and I realised this guy was not just your average dentist. This guy was a world class dentist. And it's because he was telling me about how he just went to the World Dentist Conference in, uh, you know, the US, uh, and, and the best dentists in the world are there, and they present the latest technology. And he, and he was telling me about it. He was really passionate about it. And I thought, man, I'm in good hands here. This is not just your average suburban dentist. This is a guy who actually is passionate about people's teeth. Yes, exactly. That's right. Yeah. So I think it, it uh, there's there's a lot in that, and and um, I think any you know anyone watching this, they they need to really take that away. Uh, how much are you investing in your own education and your your yeah your own improvement as a as a teacher? So to to wrap up, I know again we're taking a lot of your time up, and I really appreciate it, uh, Paul. Uh, you're a generous guy. It's obvious that you love what you do because um, you're still here. Um, so 
can, can I ask you just to finish off, are there any blogs, websites, books, anything that you would recommend to, to teachers to check out? Um, well, I would, I'd certainly recommend um, that book that I mentioned, which is the E-Myth. Um, e yep. There's another one I've just been reading, which is called The Behavioural Advantage. Um, I can't, I can't remember the name of the, the guy's name, but it's yep. about how successful companies behave. And it's, it's quite common um, for things. The other thing is um, podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. So there's a couple of, um, oh, I'd have to sh find my phone, which is not here right this second, but there's a couple of business ones that I, um, there's a great one by Her Business that I recommend. Um, Her Business is a, um, a group in, I think they're in Sydney, but they have a couple of different um, people and it's for women. But let's face it, if in the music industry, if we're teaching children, we're marketing to women most of the time, yep. you know. So it's actually really good to listen to, especially as a bloke, you go, oh, because they talk about, well, as a woman, I want to la, 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 and you go, Right, well, then that's how I need to market, you know. So it's it's gold, you know, it's marketing gold to be able to get this stuff. And it's and they're free. Like I, yeah. I go running, um, you know, I do stupid things like run marathons. And um, so I go running a lot. So I listen to these um, podcasts when I run. And sometimes I get home and I'm going, oh, I've got to write all this stuff down because it's fantastic, you know. It's you wish the, the run was longer, right? So you could keep listening yeah, to more. Yeah. Exactly. So um, yeah, all that sort of stuff is it really gives you a great um, sort of opportunity to learn learn things. Um, so her business is, is one. Um, I can't. I mean, obviously, uh, you're, you you and I both know Tim Topham, but his is piano based. Yep, but yeah, but his content is still excellent Beautiful. for any teacher. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I can't think of um, anything. That's else okay. That, that's that's good. That's a couple of things that that and 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 when I do these, I always try and just get a couple of things from each person that I interview. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that yeah, behavioural advantage. Uh, that's a book, correct? It's a book. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Um, and her business podcast. So there's two things I can take away. And I think podcasts generally get onto searching. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I love YouTube um, because I can kind of, uh, you know, I can put it on double speed. I can get through things quicker. Um, and yeah, I love all that. I, you know, audio books and and you know when I'm out, it's audio books, and when I'm here at, at home, it's it's YouTube videos. And I'm always yeah. learning, and, and it just doesn't stop. So, and that's really Absolutely. how I've come across you, Paul, because you know through Tim. I've met you and, uh, you know, it's just you start to, I think there's this whole thing about where you start to connect with people who are like-minded who are also out there learning and so the whole thing accelerates. Have you found that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You connect with, with good people. So let's wrap up. Um, thank you again so much for your time. Um, it's My pleasure. Absolute blast. Um, so it, 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 if anyone wants to get in contact with Paul for any reason, how would they get in contact with you, Paul? Can I put a link at the bottom of this video or is there sure. something you would yeah. recommend? Um, you, can, uh, <clears throat> you, you can send me an email at paulm at fortemusic.com or um, go to fortemusic.com.au forward slash Paul Myatt. We'll, um, there's a, a, a few videos, students. I've, um, done some workshops and things at the conservatorium for NAM. You can see some of the videos that I've done. Um, so if people are interested in those sorts of things, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And for those of you in the US or travelling to the US for NAM, uh, Paul, you'll be Come there. On. I'll be there on Thursday. I think it's the 15th of July. Hold on, I can tell you. I've got my calendar right here. Sorry, it is the Thursday the 13th of July. I will be speaking, I think it's at the 2 or 2.30 p.m. at um, the NAM U, which is the NAM University um, place. Everyone sits in head with headphones on because the amount of noise in NAM is unbelievable. <laughs> and um, so I'm talking about five social media strategies for your business. So it's a very wow. much around... Um, so, you know, uh, whether you're in <clears throat> education or a retailer, it's around your social media strategies for um, in, improving your business.
Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I, I, we'll have to have you again, Paul, um, maybe in six months or whatever, or I'll get you on again and, and maybe we can yeah, share some of those strategies next time. Fantastic. All right, thanks, Paul. Uh, signing thanks, off, um, and I will see you. Just hang on one second there, Paul. I'm just going to turn off, and then I'll come and talk to you one second again. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody, and I'll see you on the next one. Which